Hey y'all, welcome, welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with friends, and today I have with me Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Ah, oh my gosh. And Landon. Happy Saturday. Happy hey. Saturday. What are we doing today? Oh, also, more importantly than just happy Saturday, happy late birthday, Karen. Thank you. It was you. your birthday yesterday. It Everybody was. in the chat should just flood it with birthday messages. I'm telling Karen how awesome she is. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, I got so many lovely birthday messages yesterday. Thank you all so much to everyone who posted those in the Discord. Um, I had several servers give me really beautiful, like nice birthday messages all day. So thank you guys so much for that. <laughs> but yes, I had a very lovely birthday. We did... Um, we did a, a favorite Karen dinner, which I will tell you, I put a picture on my Instagram, but it's not very attractive. So it's called chicken slop. And basically what you do is you cook chicken and veg in your sauce and you cook it for a really long time until you can shred the chicken. And then you serve the whole thing over rice and it's like really delicious. Mm -hmm. And Levi made one that was one of my favorites, which is doing this with like a, a Merlot and balsamic vinegar sauce. I had some leftovers this morning before stream. Oh my gosh, they're so good. And then for dessert, we had a strawberry cheesecake. It was delicious. Mm -hmm. Some me some. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's, there's so much. Okay, it's in the fridge, you can have some. Okay, I'll, I'll be right over. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I did for my birthday. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, guys. But yeah, um, okay, so I guess, that was that was probably definitely more important. But so back to my question, though, what are we doing today? Uh, we are going to be ranking all of the Harry Potter movies uh, on the on the owl uh, grading chart. Mm -hmm. So our outstanding exceeds expectations, acceptable, poor, dreadful, and troll. We will be ripping all the movies apart, praising some parts that are good, and just obviously talking about how dreadful some of them are as well. Oof. So, yes. And you can Stick do it around. with us too. You can do it with us you too. So can. I put a I put a link to the tier maker that we are using. Um, but before I actually like show it on the screen, we want to do our typical um, disclaimers in regards to our Harry Potter streams. This uh, inner stage window is not a spoiler free, free stream. If you um, don't want to be spoiled about things you don't know about the you know more recent movies, because now we're going to talk about some of those, then this is not the stream for you. But like, who really cares about the dumb Dumbledore movie? We're going to talk about that at the end. You have to stay tuned to get my full takes on the dumb Dumbledore movie. Um, <laughs> but takes. yes, oh my gosh. Um, but uh, but yeah, so there will we will be talking about those movies. They're more recent, so just you know want to make it clear. There will be spoilers. Um, also, oh my gosh, um, JK Rowling, stop tweeting challenge 2022. She fails every year. She's failed already this year. Um, we do not agree with her turf crap. We do not agree with the things that she tweets. We do not agree with the way that she pushes certain political agendas in regards to her transphobia. Um, she's a menace and it really sucks when um, bad people become famous. And so, yeah, this is an anti-JKR zone too. Yep, we hate her, and she fucked hers. Fuck yeah, fucked hers. Yep, not as a person, <laughs> just like everything that she does and stands for nowadays. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> fuck hers. Fuck hers. So, which is why we also enjoy ripping this stuff apart. And yes. seeing all of the problematic behaviors within the novel that she wrote and the world that she wrote as well. It's very cathartic to uh, reanalyze some of this stuff as adults. Um, as la as very big Harry Potter fans. Okay, but y'all want to see the tears. Y'all want to see the tears. Let's let's show you. Boop. Okay. Guess what? For this time, unlike the Disney tears, we set it up so you can see both of ours. You can see that my tears are underneath me. Watch. You can all. I move it around. Oh, you can see it. Amazing. And you can see Landon's tears underneath her. So um, so we will be each doing our tiers. We'll see how similar we are at the end. And as we are doing our rankings, we'll be sharing takes on various um, aspects of the different Harry Potter movies. So yeah, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be so fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna go in chronological order, right, Landon? I think so. I think that's the best way to do it. Okay, 
okay. since it makes the most sense, which means that we're starting out with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, mm-hmm. the movie that started it all. Yes. Oh my. So many people got into Harry Potter because they started making movies of them. And so their first introduction to the Harry Potter world was this movie. Yeah. And other than the fact that it had the unfortunate bearings of being based off of a very boring book, it's a pretty good movie. In my yeah, opinion. it ac- it actually is. And actually, I just realized I forgot my water. So Landon, why don't you start with your takes and I'm going to go grab my water. I'll be right back, right. you guys. You can listen to Landon's takes on the first movie. So the thing that we fall in love with with the first book is, of course, being introduced to some of these amazing magical places that J.K.R. wrote about, specifically Diagon Alley and uh, Hogwarts, most importantly. And we get to see those things live action on the screen. And they did an amazing job with it. Like, mm-hmm. like Hogwarts Castle, breathtaking, beautiful. Just like the floating candles and the uh, sky ceiling, just like the books, a magical place. The moving staircases, I 100% wanted to exist in this world, in the world that they made. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we got to be introduced to all these places. And I think for that reason alone, it's like above a pass. Like just for how they captured the world, it's above a pass. I mean, how many times have you had a franchise and then they adapt it like to to TV or they adapt it to um, a movie or something like that? And that version just doesn't capture the essence of it. That is something that I think is very magical about the Harry Potter movies is that and we'll talk about this more as we get into some of the later ones and the changes that they do make. They, especially in the first several, they really capture the essence of what the Harry Potter world is. They, the same way as the books do, they give you that, I want to go to there feeling. Like you watch the movies, like you listen to the Harry Potter score, you see the way that they portray Hogwarts, and you're just like, oh, I want to go to there. You you see this first movie and you get introduced to this place and you're like, man, I can 100% understand how they made amusement parks based off of this Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like it is the world is beautiful and magical and the set designers did an outstanding job making us feel like we were there Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and another thing about this first movie that i think is really excellent is they actually have child actors that do a good job. And I will tell you, based on what I know of the way that these sorts of things work, if you have child actors in your movie, them doing a good job is really contingent upon the director and other staff to make them feel comfortable and confident and direct them well. And they just do an absolutely phenomenal job, especially in this first movie of getting these kids to really breathe life into these characters. You know what I mean? And I know part of it is like they cast kids that have the same personality almost as the characters, but like you almost have to, like they're kids, you know what I mean? They're not ready to be um, doing things more complicated than that, but they cast these kids, they, they are absolutely perfect in their, in their mood and everything and the way that they articulate and, um, just the the think, the actual perfection is is like mind yeah. blowing. No, the the level of care that they add to casting that we first see our first Ron and Hermione and Harry, and they are Ron, Hermione, and Harry. Uh, beautiful. Like mm-hmm. I think that one of the most quoted things in all of Harry Potter is, uh, "Or worse, expelled," which is a movie line, not yeah. a book line. Yeah, uh, and it is, it is like a beautiful just like moment for Hermione that that is it captures her so well Emma Watson does such a great job with her same thing with Rupert Grint and with Daniel Radcliffe we get to see our three they're awesome I also think um shout out to the actor who oh my gosh I cannot remember his name off the top of my head right now but the actor who played Dumbledore I think those first two years we really did get to see Dumbledore the same way that Harry saw him in those first two years. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And we got to see it as the wise old silly mystical man um, that that didn't have any of the the manipulation that we later see in the movies. So I think, fantastic job. Fantastic. And I do, you know, I am definitely somebody that thinks that I just looked up the name just to make sure I've got it. Richard Harris, the original Dumbledore that, um, you know, God rest his soul, he passed away, um, was the quintessential Dumbledore. You know, when you look at him compared to like um, Michael Gambon was the one later. 
Um, and then, of course, in the newer movies, we've got um, Jude Law, right? And um, I just think, like, when I imagine Dumbledore, I still imagine Richard Harris. And to me, he's the quintessential version of Dumbledore. So I actually have a spicy take on that. And oh. I, I, I think Richard Harris did an amazing job. But again, I think he did an amazing job for those early year Dumbledores. Mm-hmm. Michael Ga- Gabbett, as much as like he messed certain things up, he also played a Dumbledore that was much more vicious and much more, um, you know, manipulative and much more about all of those things that we as fans who have dissected the character see in Dumbledore rather than the old man who is just sitting there eating funny candy. Yeah, well, um, let's put let's put a pin in that because we're going to so, talk about yes. that more once we get to the third movie because that's where he comes in because because uh, yes. this guy we're talking about they they change over so the original Dumbledore passes away so it's a different Dumbledore in the first two movies versus the later ones. Um, okay, so all of that being said, Landon, where does the Sorcerer's Stone movie rank for you? I have to say it's not because uh, like the reality is that it's hard to separate book and movie, and at the end of the day. It's still a fairly boring story (laughs) like i still struggle with it so i'm i'm in between exceeds expectations and outstanding yeah for me it's a solid exceeds expectations like i think that there are really strong points in the movie i think the casting's amazing i think they do an amazing job of making you feel like this adaptation is true to the soul of harry potter um but there are definitely still things that are just like you know it's not very risky okay it's not very risky um, they take some more risks later, which I, I have like a lot of mixed feelings about, but this adaptation is very safe. They made, they yeah. knew what fans wanted to see and they made exactly what fans wanted to see with n- no artistic interpretation. So that's to me why it is an exceeds expectations as opposed to an outstanding. I, I agree. I think I, what I did appreciate about it though, is that it was so true to the book that yes, there weren't any risks. But it, it was so true. And I appreciated that as starting a series that, because nowadays it's like, oh, every single series that's based off of a book takes its own adaptation instead of being loyal to the book. So that's that to me is a good thing, but it still wasn't the best. There were still mm-hmm. some issues that I saw wrong with it. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick at exceeds expectations but we'll see maybe i'll feel funny during this stream and it'll pop up to outstanding here (laughs) based on where we put some other things yeah just like maybe as as we start getting into the troll level movies i'll start being like no do you remember when harry potter was good like that first movie was really good do you remember when the movies were actually entertaining (laughs) (laughs) pepperidge farm remembers (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yes okay so um, movie number two, Chamber of Secrets. So this is the one where, as you guys know that remember when we talked about Chamber of Secrets, I was not a huge fan of Chamber of Secrets initially as a kid, and I still think it's one of the weaker books in the series. And I will say, yeah. Oh, hey, Lunar. Oh, and you got first. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I will say that this is one of the times where I think the movie is better than the book. <laughs> it's like yeah, they take all the, the boring stuff good. out. <laughs> the movie's still not good. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's the deal. Like, again, it's hard. What are we judging on? What's our criteria? Because the plot sucks. All of the things that we love about the first one still exist in the second one, but we're not being introduced to it now. So we're not, so Hogwarts isn't anything new. Um, I think that the only thing that's really cool is the way that they did the magical creatures. Mm. Fox is beautiful. Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. The Basilisk is incredibly impressive. And Dobby existing within the film is so cool like they they did all of these things that they took from the books and they expanded it and blew it up and made it better than my imagination could uh but everything else all the other ways where it's like oh it was just hogwarts like nothing changed there and the movie is boring and this is happening now that i'm thinking about it lockhart casting was brilliant Mm -hmm. the casting for Lockhart was brilliant Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. I'm really torn it is better than the book but I'm still not like 
it's a good movie. <laughs> I see. I actually really like this movie, and I think it's because I felt like it was a little bit more artistic, right? They don't necessarily have the basilisk in there, um, quite like it's described in the books. But I think the way that it's portrayed in the movie is actually better. Okay, the way that the way that it's portrayed in the movie that Jenny ends up getting captured. Right. And um, it makes me feel for her because I see it happening as opposed to the way it's in the books through Harry's narrative. So um, there's just certain the, the the journey that the movie takes you on because it's condensed and because it's not just solely completely from Harry's perspective. It makes me like feel things that the book doesn't do very well. And so I, I really enjoy the second movie. I think it's great. Okay, well, I I'm I think it's it's in the positives for me because mm-hmm. all of that is true. I did definitely feel during it, even though I'm bored by it, it is still this beautiful magical world, and some of the casting choices are great. Mm-hmm. I, I think that there's just a it's a little on the camp side to me. <laughs> we start seeing the bad acting. We start seeing the cracks and like, okay, are you reading? Is someone literally feeding you this line? Come on, Rupert. Uh, we start seeing that kind of stuff. Uh, Do y'all hear that? Y'all hear that? Feels... Rupert hate. Rupert hate. Y'all hear that? Rupert slander. slander? Y'all hear it? I hear it. Listen, they're twelve. I understand. They're they're not they're not professionals. But like, for whatever reason, in the first one wasn't to that obvious and for the second one it very much where i'm just like okay this feels like children trying to act well i think they they wanted a little more freedom they were given a little bit more freedom they yes. were famous now so it's harder to tell you know them what to do when they're the, they're as famous as they had become by the second movie mm-hmm. and then i think also this movie is where it starts where they kind of well it's, it's it really it starts in the first movie but you see it even more here um, and it kind of grows as the series go, goes on, is they make a lot of changes to Hermione's character. And some of the, yes. and those changes are amazing for Hermione. But what they cause is for them to remove some of what makes Ron a good character. And he becomes kind of this like, this like dopey, um, you know, there for laughs, sidekick type sidekick. of character. Yeah, as opposed to in the books, where he really truly is um ron's best uh harry's best friend and and the moral heart of the trio whereas in the movies i would say hermione typically has the more like moral high ground in regards to it um and it's because of changes they make to their character like they literally give um you know lines uh ron's lines to hermione (laughs) in in this movie um thank you so much lunar we will hydrate landon we gotta we gotta drink some water we're talking too much Cheers. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Um, so, so, you know, I hear what you're saying. Like the, there are some flaws in this movie, but I just feel like the book is so much more flawed that when I saw this movie and still when I watch this movie today, I am just like, oh yes, like I'm having fun. You know, I'm having fun because sure. it's like, it's like a, it's like a cut the fluff, get to the stuff version of the book. And it's so much better for it. Okay. I can this, I can respect that. This cat has asked to go in and then she asked to go I, out and now she's asked to come in again. You guys, she just can't decide whether she wants to hear about Harry Potter movies or not. She's just like so torn. Lady, make a decision. Pick one. Hey, come here. Come here All right. right. No, no, no. You, If you're going to be annoying like this, you have to pay. You have to pay the dues, which is like, <laughs> come say hello to everybody. Say hi. hi. Lady. Hi, Lunar. Hi, Landon. How are you guys doing today? I'm here being very annoying, but I get away with it because I'm cute. My kitty is laying on the floor right here on top of the instructions of how to put my desk together. Jed, welcome in. Lady, I will tell you you guys the truth. Um, Oh, Jed, let me link it for you so you can do the tears with us. Um, Lady is very stressed out right now because we actually had an appointment this morning with a realtor because, as you guys know, we're moving. So we finally got a realtor and and chose one, and she came and, like, saw the house and stuff. And the appointment took two freaking hours. And um, if you have cats, you know when you have a stranger over, all the cats have to go hide, and they get really stressed out. So that's that. Lady has a reason she's being crazy right now. Like, she's not just just being a bitch to be a bitch. She's, like, literally stressed out because for two hours, yeah, she's been hiding for two hours. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm like making jokes, but but really like she has every reason to be weird right now. 
We're going to so, be yeah. gentle with her. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then all of that being said, where are you going to put it? Yeah, where do we put it? So to me, this is also an exceeds expectations, but not as much as the first one because it doesn't have the magical feeling. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. it, it's only for me like half a step down from the first movie. So it's still an exceeds expectations for me. I'm going to put this as an acceptable. I can't, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I can't get there. I have a feeling it actually has nothing to do with the movie and everything to do with how much I hate this book. I think so. I think it's just you just like dislike this book so much that there's no way they could have made an adaptation that wouldn't just be acceptable for you. Yeah, it just it would not because like, yeah, it is the bottom of the bit. The fact that it's not failing just by the book alone is amazing. Uh, <laughs> Chris Columbus is a really good Harry Potter director. Um, I agree, Jed. He, I think you're right there. Awesome. Yes, a very awesome. So yeah, um, that's our that's our first two. We've already there's already arguments in the house, you guys. We're already in disagreement. We knew that. we knew that was gonna happen. Mm -hmm, we knew mm -hmm. that. We've been new. Mm -hmm. All right. Shall we move to number three? Yes. Yeah, so number three, Prisoner of Azkaban. So Prisoner of Azkaban. Um, this is as you guys know my favorite book. I absolutely love movie serious. I absolutely love, um, you know, movie, movie uh, Remus. Remus. I think the casting for those two is just perfect. Pettigrew, Pettigrew is like a little, like, I was like, I hate that they cast him, but I love that actor. So I think that it was he does great. Awesome. He does amazing. He does great. I hate how they dressed him. Like, I yeah. hate the, the choices of, like, being more ratty than mm -hmm. any, like, than Sirius's dog and Remus's wolf. Like, I was like, that's a choice, I guess. But I think the actor is phenomenal and the 100% right choice for it. I, I think they were just trying to portray visually how yes. much um, J.K. Rowling loathes Peter Pettigrew. Because <laughs> yes. that's what comes through in the writing. Like, the way they portray him on screen, like, that's how he's written. That is how he's written. Um, that, and that just, that is what it is. And I don't think that that's realistic or how he would actually be, but that is how he is written. Yes. So. Um, but I think, I also think the pacing of this movie is fun and entertaining. The soundtrack, I do enjoy the liberties that they start taking as far as like, um, wearing muggle clothing, that we mm -hmm. have to see new parts of the castle, that it's a little darker, that it's aging that we're really going in from that child lit to YA uh, that is uh, explained in the movies as well I really really love that yeah you see um, this you see this tone shift in the movies that matches the tone shift of the books and they yes. like really translate that into a visual medium like so expertly um this is one of my favorite books and it's and and uh, like there's nothing but praise like I have nothing bad to say about this movie like truly yeah. it's I really good <laughs> I also think like another positive is that this is the movie, this and the sixth movie, we'll talk about it in the sixth movie too, is like the only two movies that you really start to see Harry's humor because he's very funny and he's very funny and sarcastic in the in the books. Uh, and he, he has his moments at least. And in the movies, he only really gets it here in the sixth one. And it's like, okay, I really appreciate that we're we're pulling in like that this feels like a like a bunch of kids. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Is this the one? This is also the one with like where we get them all sitting around the Gryffindor common room eating candy that makes them make funny noises. Like we really do get to be with the kids being kids growing up. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that those like liberties that they took that didn't change any plot or didn't rewrite anything, but made us see like what we love about the possibilities of the Harry Potter world. Yep, because at this point, we've already had two movies. You don't need to understand the way Hogwarts works. You don't need to understand no. what Hogwarts looks like. You already know all of that stuff. So it's like this: these you get these really beautiful character moments um, that we couldn't necessarily have as much in the first two movies because there's so much world to establish, right? Yeah, I got grounded for asking if they're taking the piss with the costuming in Prisoner of Azkaban. I love the costuming. That's what we were just praising. The first two I... films really banged on about the aesthetics of how I envisioned it when reading the books. And then it lost a lot of the appeal and magic by throwing that in the sea. But I like that they threw it in the sea. I think it's risky. It's risky and I think it pays off. I think that it is purposeful in this book. 
Mm-hmm. I think it loses its charm as it continues on. Um, but in this book, it's like, no, there are kids being kids, and it's fine that this is the aesthetic. And I like the fact that like muggle clothes, like the interaction of muggle clothing in the world. And I and I enjoy that aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, and again, it makes it feel more teenagery than kid. Like when you're going away for school, the first two years, you're really buttoned up and prim and proper and following all the rules. Then you hit 13 and you're like, what's she gonna do write me up rules Come are for on. losers <laughs> like I don't know if you've been in a middle school or high school recently but that's kind of how it be those like fifth grade sixth graders are following the dress code and get to seventh and eighth grade and they're just like ah, <laughs> you're gonna send me home okay fine send me home it's fine like it just yeah. it screams very true to life which I appreciate again we're in the mind of kids in this book and, and it's one of movie. those and it's one of those things where I think like they really thought about the story and tried to consider things that maybe um, that maybe didn't get considered by uh, J.K. Rowling when writing the books. Mm-hmm. It's purely about costume, definitely a nationality culture split here in the UK. We do school uniforms in a big way, bring back the robes. Like I just I disagree. Je- I don't know. Like I can't explain it to you. Then like I don't know. Like it, the way that uniforms work here, like most of our schools don't have them, and even when they have them, you do everything you can to like be out of uniform while still following the rules. Like we, nobody tells, nobody tells us what to do. Like maybe it is like a UK, US thing. I don't know. You have so little, like that's, that's an entire department's job is to come across with styling and and have that be part of telling the story. When you cut that off because you need every character to look exactly the same, that's not conducive to movie telling. It might be conducive to storytelling and accurate to real life. But as far as a movie goes, it's just not, it, it just doesn't work. You lose a major part of the character that way. Yeah. Um, because the aesthetics of watching something and watching and understanding who a character is by what they look like, understanding like the emotional turmoil that Hermione's in on how dirty her sweater is, is like an art. <laughs> there is a connection there that our brains also connect to. Uh, and yeah. when you're cutting that off at the heel, it's hard. it's hard to do that. Yep. So I I like Um, the crazy costuming in the third one is part of why I think it's really good. (laughs) When it first happened, I was like, because it was a big change, it was one and then suddenly no, and then suddenly no ropes. Um, When it first happened, I was, it was very much not a part of it, but then I grew to love the fashion of film and, and set direction and costuming. And that just made me fall in love even more with some of these choices. Mm-hmm. And you and you have to say like even if this isn't realistic to how it would be in the UK like it was still an all UK staff pretty much so somebody must have thought like it's fine to not be realistic you know what yeah. I mean so yeah for me this movie like outstanding I love it I love it I love you know and it's and it's partly also because this movie and this book is what starts like us really understanding the Marauders. Right, mm-hmm. Prisoner of Azkaban is where we get introduced to a lot of that stuff, and y'all know like I'm a Marauders girl. Like I absolutely love the Marauders. So a third book and third movie, it's like very special place in my heart for those two. And again, that pacing, that humor, that sounds like the soundtrack's even faster. Like I appreciate that they're taking us through the year even more faster and faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the book is the book is like that too, but I appreciate it in the movie. Yeah, showcase with robes, uniform, just needs slightly more subtle hinge on accessories, hair, makeup, that kind of thing. I hear what you're saying, and I do see that in anime. So, like, I know it's possible because I have seen things that do that. Um, but, like, you know, I'm not subtle. <laughs> I'm extra, yeah, so. I think, it's, I think it's also harder, and also I think it, like, the director definitely came in and was like, I want to be cool, and then he did it. And then he was mm-hmm. cool, and it was cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. Jed, do you think that you're... Um, that your opinion is closer to what most people in the UK would think. I don't really know necessarily. I just know that I like it. I like the choices and I think they're cool. So yeah, Prisoner of Azkaban, favorite book. And it's it's probably my favorite of the movies too. Like we'll see as we kind of yeah. talk about them and where I decide to rank them. But if I'm just thinking about it holistically, I bet you by the end, I'm going to say this is my favorite of the movies as well. Um, so, yeah. I have a contender in there, so we'll see. I have a contender personally, so we'll see who ends up on top. We'll yeah. See. Yep. All right, shall we move to the fourth? Yes, movie number four, Goblet of oh. Fire. Did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Oh my god, that moment alone ruined everything! 
Um, <laughs> the movie that launched fun. a thousand memes. We didn't even call uh, them memes back then, but that's what happened. <laughs> also, like, let's throw in the sexism of making all of the girls from Germ or all of the girls from Boba Tongs and all of the boys. Why? What a stupid change. For no fucking reason other than we want the boys school, the girls school, and then there's the co ed school because Hogwarts better. Which is it's stupid. literally. It's literally an aesthetic so choice stupid. with absolutely no meat behind it. It is just pure visual. Sexism. No, and it's like so hollow. I hate that change. Oh, I hate it I so much. I hate it, and I hate that all the girls are demure, demure and beautiful, and they dance in their entrance, and the boys are all like grunty and do, 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 gross, do, do. and it's just yeah. like and scary. And I'm like, that's not. No, why is this an aesthetic choice that was chosen to be made? And uh, none of that happened in the books. None, none of, it. of it. None of it. In fact, the fact that there were co-ed schools was great and fantastic and so fun. Um, but none of it, none of it happened. They decided for no reason whatsoever other than we want to do this mm-hmm. to make it, to make, to make it separate by sexes. And I hate that. It's so dumb. I hate it. And Jed, you're so right. Why does everyone have the same haircut in Goblet of Fire? Another strange aesthetic choice that I hate. Why? Yes, the long hair in the Goblet of Fire. I'm just like, wow, Daniel Radcliffe is only his mullet. Um. But it would be fine if they had like, if like, if Daniel Radcliffe had a mullet in that movie, but like literally they gave, they give like everyone these long shaggy haircuts. Everyone. So, this is. This is also the thing that I hate the most, though, because it's like the whole point, like it's it's a part in the books that Harry's haircut and style stays the same. It's it's the one thing that's consistent. His aunt cuts off all his hair in the first book and it grows back the next day. So, like, I understand it's a stylistic. I understand that this is a tiny little thing. But the wildness of the haircuts through these three books makes me so angry as a Harry Potter fan. It's just dumb. Do There's I no have, reason. It's so dumb. I'm like, man, you can show the maturity and the style without making them look, like, ridiculous. But you know what would have been, like, a better choice? Like, if they wanted to give, like, just Ron a shaggy mullet. Yeah. Like, and then, oh then it would have been, like, oh, Ron's doing like something funny with his hair like that's like a cool little character trait but no, it, but it's not it's not a character choice okay it is literally an aesthetic choice that they do to everyone yes. for no reason it's the dumb director loved long hair I mean it's the same director we saw in the third so we see him we see it with Sirius Black we see it with a couple of other side yeah, but you know what? And then all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden, we see it with our main trio. And but I you know what? It. When it when it comes to serious, like the it Beatles were the Beatles were big when he was a kid. You know, like he lived through the yeah. era where that haircut would make sense, and we're supposed to see him as kind of a man child. So of course he should have a weird shaggy haircut, right? But there there's no reason why kids in the '90s would be having that. All of them, that all of them would not be having that in the '90s. Like and I was like, there, fam. I was there Not even in the 90s because this hair this hairstyle wasn't even cool in the 2000s. Like that's the other thing too. It wasn't a cool haircut for when the movies were being filmed to make their ki- their characters look cool. And it wasn't a cool haircut for when the movies took place. It was just like the stupid hair choice. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. And then and, we have go ahead. Yeah, and then and then we have like oh my god. Okay, so I know that when we talked about this book, I said this, like, in a technical sense, this is the best book, right? Like, quality-wise of the writing, the pacing, the characters, all of that. Like, it is just objectively the best book, in my opinion. So, I had high expectations for this movie. I really did. And um, I will say, like, after the, the high of Prisoner of Azkaban and, like, all the memes about Dumbledore screaming about the Goblet of Fire, like, there's just parts of this movie where I'm just, like, why? I'm just like, I don't know, it just doesn't land for me. And I, I think this book is amazing. Like, this book makes me scared, like, at the end, where we've got the scene, and he's, you know, follows Cedric Diggory, and Cedric cool. dies, and all this stuff. And, and in the movie version, it's just like, I don't know, I just feel like different choices could have been made throughout this movie. And I understand that they don't have the time, they don't have the audience, they don't have the ability to do this. But the parts that what made the action sequences in this book mean something 
was the tension building and like the juxtaposition of the beauty that was existing with it. So it was things like we were underwater and Harry was scared to be dying and Grindy Blow could snap it could snap his like ankle at any moment. But also we're discovering this beautiful underwater culture that's existing in Hogwarts. Like we're we're seeing that. And instead it's just like murky dark water and things are somewhat attacking him and it's gonna be all of three minutes. And again, that's a choice that they probably had to make for time. Uh the also we have with the maze. Like the maze is so much more intense and has so much more things hidden around and the riddle from the Sphinx and uh, the blast and the scroops and all of these things that make it truly like an almost D&D dungeon and the adventure game that all of a sudden get lost and just make a creepy hedge maze that moves sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it, it loses that tension and build up so that when we have these moments, we're way less impressed than we ha- would have been if there was more choices and more build up. Mm-hmm. And I know like a movie is a different medium, right? And so sometimes yeah. like there's just there's just things that you have to do. But that's why sometimes movie adaptations are wildly different than the book that they're based on because mm-hmm. it's impossible to do certain things that a novel can do. Right. Um, Prison of Azkaban and Goblet of Fire. There's a shitload of character omissions, which really cucked the later films. That is true. That is very true. Yeah. And I think that um, Bobby being a big one in this. Yeah. Bobby yep. Thinking. Yep. And I think that I think that Goblet of Fire, um, especially, you feel the pain of that in a way that you don't quite feel yet when you're watching Prisoner of Azkaban. But when you start awesome. watching Goblet of Fire, you see the stupid hair, you hear Dumbledore yelling, you're like, wait a second. We also wait didn't a talk second. About the, wor- the other worst character choice that was made in this. And that was love him to good death, think he did awesome, but David Tennant and his fucking tongue thing. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's him, the whole movie. <laughs> it's like, why? 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 Like, oh. The twitch, the tongue twitch is just, I'm just like, doesn't exist in the books, first of all. Like, very important thing. This is a David Tennant choice. Didn't exist in the books. And then they just did it. And I was just like, I hate that. If you need to give a visual sort of cue to cue in the audience of, hey, this guy could be the same person. Why that? Out of everything. Why that? <laughs> See, that that choice to me, like, I have a different take. That choice to me is, like, Ugh. so chaotic and so out of it. left field that it circles back to, like, being campy and I love it. <laughs> no. Because, like, here's the deal. None of the other movie, none of, nothing else about the movie was campy. The movie, you hear is my biggest issue with this movie. This movie took itself self too seriously. Like that's, I feel like almost everything in this movie took itself too seriously in a way that the others hadn't, but failed on delivering tension that deserves to be taken that seriously. And then made this, these wild campy choices, like dancing, like a rock, rock music at the Yule Ball and uh, the tongue thing and Dumbledore yelling at Harry that I'm just like, why? (laughs) Why? (laughs) It's almost as like they tried to do everything all at once and therefore it didn't just none of it really did what it needed to do. None of it stuck. Although I will say something back. The concert at the Yule Ball, while campy, was awesome. Yeah, did see? That. Like that's how I feel about the tongue did thing. And that. I feel that way about the Yule Ball too. Like when they make campy choices in this movie, I really enjoy them. But you're right in the sense that they don't follow that through. They still try to have that really like amazingly intense end. But because they have made so many campy choices throughout the whole film, that amazingly intense end doesn't land the way that it does in the books. So yeah, you're totally right. So um, because of that, for me, this is barely acceptable. Barely. And the only reason it gets acceptable, the only reason it gets acceptable is because it is 2022 and people still say in that damn Dumbledore yelling meme, okay, that has longevity and um, you got to give them a little point, a little half little point for what making such a good meme. (laughs) Um, I do think that there are some really cool choices that were made in this movie, even though I've complained a lot. Uh, the casting for Fleur de Clore was amazing. Such Love a degree Fleur. and Robert Pattinson, Robert Pattinson held his own. Mm-hmm. Uh, the end scene with the maze, that scene alone where Harry arrives 
and Cedric is dead and Cedric's father is just shouting, he won my boy. And then you hear the crowd understand what has happened. Like that alone makes this movie acceptable. Nothing else does though. <laughs> there are really good moments so, like, in this movie. There are some high quality movie moments and they fairly outweigh the things that irk me. So I am also on that other side of acceptable uh aspect of this movie yeah it's not a bad movie like it's just it's just um it's just disappointing compared to the book which isn't always a fair assessment for for a movie because you have to make certain other choices um that means that sometimes you just can't do what the book did you know that's just that's just the truth which is why for me like not having dobby in it doesn't count against it yeah. It's, the cho- it's the choices that they deliberately made that did stray from the books that made no sense, such as like like the separation of genders in the schools that I was just like, this is stupid. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Chinese fireball. Whoa. <laughs> oh my gosh, Jed, you're cracking me up. I love your opinions. I love having your opinions here, Jed. You got some spicy ones. <laughs> spicy? I have to turn the should join the twitch on my phone so i can see what some of these spicy opinions are yeah i'm i mean i'm reading you most of his comments but yes you should see them so yes um so yeah uh acceptable acceptable but i think it would be higher if i didn't think that the book was so damn good i do say that i the the fact that this book is very very good um is part of why this movie is only acceptable it's true so you know um Order of the Phoenix. Order of the Phoenix. Okay, so what do we think? What do we think? This is now this book. I had a lot of stuff to say about this book. We got we got our Antifa full of cops. Never would happen in real life, but in Harry Potter world, Antifa's full of cops. Um, That's how it is. Uh, So movie version, movie version of Order of the Phoenix. Thoughts. (laughs) I liked the casting. For a lot of the Order of the Phoenix. Tonks? Tonks, Kingsley Shacklebolt, mm. um, Mundungus Fletcher, although I don't think he comes in until later. Um, Bill Weasley we see for the first time. Um, I, I enjoy a lot of those aspects. I like Grimald Place. I think that they did a fantastic job uh, introducing us to a new place. I think this is the first time since um the beginning that we've or no since the burrow in the second movie that we've seen like a new place uh and i like it i think that they did a really good job with grimald i also think daniel Radcliffe's acting like takes a three notches up in this Mm -hmm. movie Yep. Uh, and that makes it a much more enjoyable movie. <laughs> the acting classes are clearly paying off for the kids starting yes. in this movie. It's kind of like you see their thought process of where they start to like themselves internally get it. Like they start, it starts to kind of click with them, like how you're supposed to do this acting thing, what you're supposed to be doing, what you're supposed to be thinking about. I definitely think that is true um, in this movie. This is like the first one where you're just kind of like, huh, these kids are kind of good actors. Like they kind of, they kind of get it. Like, I like yeah. it, you know? Oh, no, lady, um, don't hit the microphone. That's loud for them. Sorry. I also appreciate, I also appreciate the, uh, the tone shift from something that got really dark and is somehow even darker in this mm-hmm. movie. Mm-hmm. And you see it in the aesthetics that everything is dark physically. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate that because that's a lot of what Harry is feeling. And so it's that visual storytelling since we can't be inside of his head. Right. Um, in fact, I think not being inside of Harry's head made this movie more enjoyable than the book. I would agree with you because if from this book, and this happens in the in the next book too, um, like the kids are freaking snarky and they're mean. Yeah. Like Harry, Hermione, and Ron all are are kind of like really mean kids and not having the internal monologue of harry and having to cut most of the lines where hermione is just like quite frankly being a bitch um for time reasons it makes the characters like 
much better. Like this is where it kind of turns around and we start to see in fandom that like movie version of Hermione totally surpasses book version of Hermione. And this is like what people consider as like the quintessential version of the character almost. Like it's very subtle. I don't think anyone would have told you that at the time, but that is how it felt in the fandom is that like Emma Watson's version of Hermione was Hermione in the mind of fandom. Um, Because it's not just Harry. It's not just not being in Harry's head that makes this this movie better. It's also, like, just all the random lines that had to be cut of conversations between the trio where they're just being mean. Yeah. Um, I also think that because we're not in Harry's head or because of directing choices, um, Harry doesn't seem passive in this yeah he seems he seems to have taken a step back and is a follower more than a leader but there's a difference between following and needing that encouragement to like go forth and do and being passive um and harry in the books was a was was basically written in passive tense passive yeah tense. uh and in this he's like at least doing things and it doesn't feel passive it just sounds it just sounds like he needs encouragement to do it yeah, because without his internal monologue, you have no clue that he really doesn't want to do anything and just wants to sit down yeah. and do nothing. You have you have no idea of that. So you get to kind of like make your own um, interpretation of his actions. And of course, your natural interpretation is going to be much more favorable than the reality of his internal monologue in the books that makes him incredibly passive. Um, so yeah, this is this is another one where I think that some of the choices that the movie takes really actually... Um, are are good choices that elevate the story, you know, and things where, you know, as somebody making an adaptation, I think you almost have to take like a fandom approach in a way where you're sort of remixing, like keeping what's good, throwing out what's bad, changing what could be better. And um, and this movie does a lot of that with the choices of, of what it cuts. Like, I think this is the one, um, Umbridge is the villain in this one, or is it the next one? No, Umbridge is the villain in this one, right? Um, have I got that right, Landon? Uh, next one, yeah. No, Umbridge no, is this it? One, sorry. This one, okay. Yeah. So, so like, I'll, so like an example scene that I always cite where I'm like, no, actually, sometimes the movies are better than the books. And my example scene, go to scene, is from this movie, and it is when Trelawney is fired. Okay. Yeah. In the books, when Trelawney is fired, the kids, like the three main kids, are all like, "Yay, she sucked anyway." Like, literally, that's their reaction. Like, it's so sad. Like, we as readers, I think, are supposed to feel sad even in the books, but you can't because you've literally got Harry, Hermione, and Ron being like, well, fuck Trelawney anyway. Oh, so sorry. She stepped on the keyboard. Yeah, you have to do the empathy level of realizing what is happening to yeah. feel sad about it because Harry does not do it. No, and neither does Hermione and neither does Ron. But in the movie, like, there's this there's this sad music. They, they pan across Harry, Hermione, and Ron's faces, and they're all horrified that Trelawney's getting fired like it is very emotional and it hits you like oh wow what umbridge is doing is super unfair and wrong and like morally reprehensible and it's not just about how the fact that she you know uh had a lot of uh, violence in regards to how she did her detentions with harry like it's also in how she's running the school and look she's doing violence to trelawney too it's not just that she hates kids she is just a bad person period in to everyone but you don't necessarily get that in the books um if you're doing a very surface level reading but in the movies it is clear it is defined that scene is tragic the way that it would be in real life absolutely tragic i also umbridge's umbridge's casting is amazing it is it is there are a few characters that i feel like could could not be anybody else. Severus Snape mm-hmm. could not be anybody else but Alan Rickman. Yeah. Minerva McGonagall could not be anybody else than Lady Maggie Smith. Mm-hmm. Umbridge could not be anybody else but, oh, her name's not Tilda Swinton. Oh, I forgot her name, but you know who I'm talking about. Um, yes. I'll look it up real quick so we've got the actress's name because yeah. she is excellent as umbridge she's about to she's about to be the uh queen she's about to play queen elizabeth in the crown for the next season. yes i saw that she's gonna be um, awesome as okay no, Im- no, Imal- it's, imalda, it's imalda staunton. staunton it's imalda staunton, staunton. 
Yeah. So I'd be pro- your brain probably did like Staunton, Swinton. Anyway, I'm all to Staunton. Um, she's amazing. And it's not just her acting either. Like the way they style her, the way that they do the set for her office, like it's just, it's, Im- it's, yeah. Casting was impeccable. Agree. Her casting is impeccable. Yes. Um, and again, back to the styling, like when you're reading Umbridge, you're reading about the ridiculousness of the cats and you're reading about the ridiculousness of her always wearing pink and always being cheerful and all of these things of like prim perfectness and it because it's a book it doesn't come across campy it's very hard to come across campy in a book Mm -hmm. there is a very delicate line that it could cross into campy in a movie Mm -hmm. and it didn't no such an amazing job outweighing her with the horror of who she is and the actress did such an amazing job with just being like the character that it never once in one point in time where you like this is ridiculous you were just horrified yeah uh by all of the things that were happening yep and actual that's visceral actual visceral hate a hundred percent under a hundred percent and she really like solidified this idea in my mind of like oh yeah evil people can be like prim and proper and cute and all these things. And I don't know, I'm sure I, I, I've told you guys this before because we've already done this book and we've talked about Umbridge, but there was in my past, I didn't actually have this teacher. I had a different teacher, but it was in one of the fifth grade teachers was Umbridge. Like this woman was Umbridge. Like and her obsession though was not cats, it was cows, okay? Her whole, her whole classroom was cows. She was very like pretended like she was the fun teacher. She was not the fun teacher. She very pretended like, you know, she was always right and very prim and proper and all this stuff. And she was not. Okay. So like I knew a real life Umbridge whose obsession was cows. And so when I saw Umbridge on the screen, I was like, oh my God, it's Miss. I'm not going to say her name. Cause like, I don't even know. Don't um, I don't, I mean, I assume it was a long time ago and she's not teaching anymore, but like, just in case, like this woman was crazy. So like, she would actually be like, she would like send an angry letter, I do believe. Um, (laughs) But like, when I saw her on the screen, I was literally like, wow, that is miss, you know, and in the books, like you kind of get that, but like, it's not the same as when you see it. And just, they just do such a good job. Such a good job. Love it. Absolutely love on bridge. Um, we're giving a lot of props to this book i do need to say some of my critiques and that is that this movie is the longest book Mm -hmm. and the shortest movie Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you lose a whole goddamn lot yes you do you lose a lot that sets the next book up and our next movie up in my opinion for failure (gasps) lunar tier three oh my gosh lunar that means we get to get you a postcard um, I am very bad at doing the postcard, so I will warn you, it will come someday, I promise, but it's a whole process. I got to write it, and then I got to mail it to Landon, and then Landon will mail it to you. Um, but yes, please be patient with us with the postcards, especially when I'm in the process of moving them. I make myself a note. Um, thank you so much. You're the second one ever to uh, to get one of those Amazing. from us. So thank you, Lunar. <gasps> thank you, Lunar. So yeah, we'll get that to you, but just please be patient with me. It might be a while. <laughs> But you will get one. I promise. It will come eventually. We promise. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but yeah, so I would say that there is a lot cut. And if we go back to like the point, like I'm going to scroll up the chat, what Jed said about like some of the characters that they cut in the third and fourth one start to really come back and bite them. I, I, I can't find mm-hmm. the comment. He had a he had a more cleverer word of way, of the way to say it. Um, but uh, you, you really see it in this movie because like they, they cut a lot of stuff that happens in this book and a lot of the choices that they make and what they cut, I feel like is partly because of other things that they cut in previous movies. And so you have like cuts upon cuts upon cuts upon cuts that really do affect the last two um, stories that we get from Harry Potter movie versions. So yeah, there are some choices in this that like, I really do think that if they had waited until all the books were published and were making the movies, that this movie would have turned out very differently if someone were to go back and like remake them all now with what we know about what ends up happening in the books i also think a place it was a shame that they cut is we saw nothing of the of the mystery the um oh my gosh not hall of mysteries the the ministry of magic the um not the ministry of magic we see that mysteries department of mysteries oh yeah yeah we see we don't see it that much where the unspeakables like, work yeah or the unspeakables or what they're working on. i mean that was 
part of what made this book so cool was the hunt. Some of it was campy, obviously, in, in the book. Again, very hard to make campy, but a small a Death Eater turning it from a full-grown man to a baby's head. Cross that line. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but being able to see, like, the brain room being able to see the love room, being able to see the time turners, all of those kinds of things that made, made that last part really interesting and really cool wasn't there. Yeah, they either got cut or they go um, by so fast that you're like blinking, you miss it. Cutting out Sirius Black to the extent that they did in the fourth book and in this book made, meant that his death wasn't anything. Mm -hmm. I felt nothing when Sirius died. Mm -hmm. um, that's not true. I felt rage because they added in the James. <laughs> um, <laughs> calling him his father as he died. Okay, uh, but like they were trying to that. shortcut all of those things from all the stuff they cut from him, okay? Like it was their, it was their compromise. It was their compromise. Yeah, it sucked. It, yeah, it I, made, I was like, man, I was supposed to care about this character. And I do care about this character because I care about the book version of him. But looking just at the movies... Sirius Black gets 12 minutes of screen time, maybe, through the three movies that he's in. Yeah, it's true. That's nothing. And then this is supposed to, this, this is supposed to be the death that changes everything for Harry. This is supposed to be the thing that makes him care again and get involved and get him ready so that he can then become Dumbledore's soldier next time. Mm -hmm. Like, like, this is supposed to be impactful, and it's not. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's so we can talk about all the good, but like the reality is, is that there were some bad takes in this movie. Yes, no, there definitely was. There definitely was. And um, because of uh, the way that they cheapened this movie as far as like what they chose to cut um, really makes the, the next adapting the next two books very difficult on them in a way that it didn't have to be, where if they would have just made this movie a little bit longer, had a little bit more meat in it they wouldn't have had to like, you know, do certain things in the next two movies. So for me, this is an, another one where I think it is just like barely acceptable. You know, um, it is really carried by those few things that I really, really like and really like, you know, it's carried by Umbridge. Um, it's carried by, uh, by some of those types of choices um, to where I can forgive some of the other things. <laughs> I think that where like Prisoner of Azkaban, not Prisoner of Azkaban, where, um, well, Prisoner of Azkaban succeeded in this too, but also Chamber of Secrets was punished for my dislike of the book. Uh, this one is rewarded for my love and connection to some of the characters in the book. Mm. Uh, that if I was just a fan who had never read the books, I have a feeling that this, mo this movie would be much poorly rated than where I'm going to put it. Yeah. I, and I do remember uh, people that didn't read the books. Like, this was one of the movies where people were like, I had no idea what the fuck was going on. Sorry. I didn't follow yeah. it. <laughs> um, and that sucks because on a movie, on a movie basis, that's not what you want. But mm -hmm. that's what they did. That is what they did. Yes. So shall we shall we sort yes where where are you sorting it i think because of that bias because mm. i have the connection to sirius because i know the room of requirement could have been so much more i'm gonna throw it in acceptable yeah it's acceptable for but me but i'm too. going to throw it I don't know if it's before or after Chamber of Secrets for me. <laughs> I, I see what I'm, you're saying. I'm going to know because Chamber of Secrets bores me. Fifth book makes me angry. I'm going to keep Chamber of Secrets at the top of acceptable and the fifth, and the fifth one to follow that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's fair because for me, it does go like, like this. Like I've got the fifth one here. It's a little bit better than... Um, the other one I've put for Before. acceptable, the, yes. yeah, yes, so, yes, yes. So far, we are in the same order. We're just a different, one movie is at a different tier than the other. Yeah, I, that's exactly what's happening. We've ranked them in the same order. I just think that um, Chamber of Secrets is exceeds expectations instead of acceptable. Yeah. Yep. Okay, right. Half-Blood Prince. <sighs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> this movie. Oh. oh, this is where all of the facts that they cut every character that they cut, every relation that they cut. This is where it accumulates and it just falls flat on its face. Uh, it's very hard to say anything good about this movie. 
yeah, this movie is kind of like, oh shoot, we have to make another one. That's how it feels. Um, it is very rushed. Um, yeah. I think the criticism of this movie, as well as the previous movie, is part of what led to the final book being turned into two movies because they didn't want to rush. But we're gonna talk about that when we get there. Capitalism um, rushed that one too. Well, yeah, because we've got a good other opinions on that. <laughs> but like, if, if there's movies that they should have turned into two movies, it would have been to me the fifth and sixth book, not the seventh book. Um, and this definitely suffers from that. Like this movie, if you have not read the book, it is nonsensical. The only reason okay. it's it's any good is because it puts visuals to the book. It as a standalone yeah. movie, it makes no sense. It has pre work. It's a movie with pre work. Like you can't just go see the movie. <laughs> well, and, and hypothetically, at this point, you wouldn't have just gone and seen see the movie. No. Right? You so would they could have get away watched with the it. first five movies that you could, would have watched the first five movies in order to get to this movie. Yeah, but the even I think... Is, the I think issue even... is is that if you hadn't just watched the fifth movie, yes. if, it, you, if you'd had been that you watched the fifth movie when it came out in, in theaters and then you waited the year for the next movie to come out, you would have been so fucking lost. So lost. Um, this is hinging on the fact that you've either read the books or you've watched all the movies within the last two months. Yeah, yeah. Or I guess if you really, really love um, Severus Snape, then you can have enjoyment in this movie. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> not really at all. He's not um, oh, this movie. Uh, say what things that save this movie that it's not going to be my troll. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert: where this movie is going to end up. Um, Tom Riddle casting for young Tom Riddle, awesome. Mm. Uh, did you know that joseph Slughorn? morgan tried out for that part i love that for him i do too i'm it's sad really, he didn't get it he would have been really good too sad. but the, but the choice that they made was good it. oh it was fine um love because i love a good villain backstory and yeah. also like here's the other thing that's playing into this i know i'm biased sixth book is my favorite book we just discussed this yeah so like the fact that the movie is so dreadful makes me so angry um Okay, but casting for Horace Slughorn and the whole Horace Slughorn thing, fantastic. Harry's actually funny in this one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whose decision it was, whether it was Daniel Radcliffe's or the director's that was like, actually, Liquid Luck is going to get you drunk. Uh, whoever made that decision, though, A+. Plus. A I plus agree. Great addition to uh, the lore amazing not in the book at all in the book at all harry is just like i have a gut feeling i'm gonna go follow it but in this one it's like i'm actually just wasted <laughs> uh, i love it mm -hmm. um and also we get more drapple content which is Draco malfoy and apples so really that those are the things that save this movie to not be trolled for me so I have to apologize to um, to people. I made Drapple the thumbnail of our shipping video because I thought that was really funny. <laughs> so and we much. didn't talk about Drapple at all. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Not really, but I'm like a little bit sorry. But I literally just did it for the memes because um, Drapple was, is the best. Uh, that's clickbaity of you, Karen. How dare you? Well, then more people should click on it. <laughs> true. Uh, Drapple is the best. It's true. Uh, Drapple it's is true. my one true love. Uh, and we get more Drapple content here. Oh, we also, do. have to throw in my hates. So sorry. I have very passionate opinions about this book, or about this movie. Movie Ginny is the worst thing to ever fucking happen. Yeah. 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 And, and she I, had so I much know. room for improvement. She had so much room for improvement compared to book Ginny, and they literally were like, let's make it worse. Let's make it worse. And I feel like it's not Bonnie White's fault. I feel like it has to be somebody else's fault. Because I've seen her in other things, and she's fine. Poor direction, poor writing, who poor knows? Direction, I just know poor writing. I just She's know terrible. that movie Jenny sucks. She's terrible. Yeah. I love their get together. I love their get together in the book. I was a Hinny fan for the longest time. It was one of my favorite things. I read that chapter over and over and over again. I was so fucking disappointed for whatever half ass little thing that happened in the movies. I was just like, what is happening? It wasn't good. It just, it wasn't cute. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't nothing, you know, it wasn't nothing in the movie. 
Um, I mean, Jenny is awkward in the book, but you don't even really necessarily know how awkward she is because. But she's not. Yeah, because, like, well, because Harry barely notices her, right? Yeah, but in the movie, they try to, me. yeah, in the movie, yeah. they try to, like, play up that she's, like, oh, she's so awkward. She has this crush on Harry, yada, yada. But, like, you, f the movie totally forgets about the part where her friend is basically, like, everyone thinks Ginny is hot and she's got all these dates and she's having no problem getting guys. And she's, you know, exes with whoever that one dude was. I can't remember who she's exes Dean with. Thomas. but Yeah, yeah, she's exes with Dean Thomas. And, like, you know, it's implied by the way that her friend talks about her that, like, Jenny's hot shit and everyone wants to date her um so that doesn't happen a, in the movie she, like at all and she's a sports girl like she's a total jock like I love oh my god book Jenny is my favorite I love her so much we don't give enough love to her uh, mm -hmm. on the stream but man the movies did her dirty yes they did this movie particularly did her dirty they made her like just a hairy fangirl like she's she's lady yeah. colin creevy you know what i mean she has no personality and then she's like so timid and it's like watching two timid people and i hate it i hate it because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. harry's uh, got no game which do that does match yeah. the books so <laughs> it does but like man yes man two indeed so yeah. i'm we can talk about it more but i'm just gonna put it there poor it's poor for me it's, it's poor i I remember watching, seeing this movie in the theaters, and even though, like, I have a lot of criticisms of various things in the Harry Potter movies, this was the first movie I, where I, w I came out the theater, like, not hype, you know? Like, just like, that was good, but you know what I mean? They, they did, there is not a thing that they did to redeem anything. I, no. I watched this movie and I died a little inside. <laughs> I was just like, wow, okay, this is terrible. I hate but, all of this. And, but, you know, these um these conversations are just making me think that, like, you know, wouldn't it be fantastic if someday we could get a Harry Potter remake with a new cast that was more like a prestige TV show style mm -hmm. so that you didn't have to cut so much so that you HBO could still... Max. Yeah. Make it happen. You have yeah, so that you guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And then you could still deliver, like, what's so great about the Harry Potter movies without the limitations that yeah. ultimately cause them to start getting bad. Yes. HBO, Max, you, you got it. I know Warner Brothers has the contract, I think, for a few more years, for, like, 10 more years or something like that. Like, no other... But Warner Brothers has enough money to put on a prestige TV it. show. They could do it. But I don't think... I'm sure. On what streaming platform... <laughs> I think that's the issue. Uh, Warner Brothers and HBO don't. They're two different uh, companies. Yep. So I don't think that they would mix. So Warner Brothers would have to get its own, which, you know. It we don't need more streaming it's services. Making, Let's not do that. Let's not do that. It's also making so much money on its own right now that it doesn't need to. If that's the true. revenue from the parks alone, Warner Brothers is going to be sitting pretty forever. Those parks are amazing, by the way. And, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. All right, you guys, so before we go forward, we would actually like to pause here. It is time for a, a little Audible ad break. So as you guys know, Interstage Window is sponsored by Audible. You can sign up for your free trial at um, audible.com slash Interstage Window. You get a 30-day free trial. Follow that link. Um, we get little perks from doing that. So if you are interested in signing up for Audible, you should absolutely do it through our link. And honestly, if you're not that interested yet, um, you should be because audiobooks are great. They are. They're fantastic. Yes. And today I will be showing you Cinder. Let's see if I can go in there. Cinder is by Marissa Meyer, who is one of my favorite authors. She's fantastic. Cinder is a uh, young adult futuristic sci-fi um, version of Cinderella mm -hmm. with uh, queer and POC characters abound. Uh, it's a lot of fun. There are aliens involved and also nanotech and also uh, an evil queen trying to take over an empire and love and fighting and badass women. It's amazing. And th the entire series brings me nothing but joy. There's lots of representation, a lot of fun and a lot of jokes. So check it out. Deeps really love Cinder. It's very popular. It's got a nice little fandom to it fun. too. It's, it's fun. I love it. I hope that they make a movie series out of it soon. And or a TV show. That would be cool. That would be so nice. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for listening to our little Audible ad break. Okay. okay. The last book, they split into two different movies. So we're going to have two conversations. 
So for Deathly I Hollows really... Part One, thoughts. <laughs> I liked it. So here's you the like deal. Part one? Like after after two movies and four years of just wishing that they would dive in deeper and give the detail that that made the story so amazing and the characters attention that made them who they are they gave it to us and i kind of liked it um not a huge harry fan in this particular book or movie um but i thought Ron was amazingly well developed. I thought Hermione was amazing. I enjoyed the extended camping trips. I enjoyed the tension building. The reality is, is though, it's not a standalone movie. Like it, it, it came out as a standalone movie, but it's not. It's a prequel to the final, uh, and it is it is truly a part one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate that because I wish that they would just let part ones and parts two come out in the same year. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, so they have the same problem. And we, remember, remember we have our episode on The Matrix. If you're interested in that, you need to go to my YouTube channel, go find the playlist for The Matrix. Um, the whole reason they did this is truly because The Matrix did it and got away with it and made a lot of money. And this movie has the same problem that The Matrix sequel has, where it's like a whole movie of setup and there's no payoff. And so you can't just watch it. You have to watch it back to back. The same way that I recommend watching the Matrix sequels. Do not watch movie two and then later movie. You got to do, it's like a whole one thing. It's okay, it's one thing. One, it's one movie split into two. Yeah. And so this first movie, it's just, it's all set up and then it's over and you're like, <gasps> you know, it feels like, <gasps> you know, it's like I watch in this movie, I got blue balled. Like, where is the payoff? Where is it? It doesn't, I, I just watched like all this camping, like they're, they're going, they're hanging out in the woods. They're running through the woods. They're running through the woods. Movie over. What? It yeah. Characters die. All of a sudden things are dire. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate like the attention dessert, but what I hate, I hate about the fact that it was this, and then we had to wait a whole last year. Uh, and then I hate also that it started the trend. Like Matrix did it first, but this truly started the trend because all of a sudden every single other YA series that was a movie did this. Breaking Dawn Part You're 1, right. Part 2. Uh, uh, Hunger Games Part 1 and Part 2. Scorched Trials Part 1 and Part 2. Like it literally became a trend amongst YA series to do a Part 1 and Part 2. And it was because that even though this movie pissed off fans, gave us blue balls, it made a shit ton of money. Yes. All of a sudden, because remember, they filmed at the same time, they cast it at the same time. So it really was treated like one movie that had just been expend expanded filming process. So it cost a little bit more, but all of the pre-production costs were cut because they didn't have to do pre-production. They only had to do pre-production for one movie. And all mm -hmm. the post-production, for the most part, other than editing and scoring, was about the same amount. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like, all of this pre-production and post-production, they saved a shit ton of money by doing two different movies, released at two different times, and they made billions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that much, but they made a ridiculous amount of money. And studios saw that and went... That's what I'm doing. Could I borrow Woods for a movie, please, Director McGonagall? So this is actually, um, of, as far as the movie posters go for Harry Potter, the poster that is the most accurate to the movie, it's literally just the three kids running through the woods. And when you watch the movie, yeah. it's literally just the three kids running through the woods. <laughs> accurate advertisement. Truly. Accurate advertisement there. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's like this movie it you can't you can't um analyze it by itself you have to analyze it with its sequel and yet they didn't release it in that way like and and i and this trend luckily now that prestige tv is like the the big big deal i feel like this trend is kind of dying um because everybody yes. wants to be a tv series now instead so you know bless i'm so happy um but like at this time it was just awful no one liked it but we wouldn't stop spending our fucking money on it so ceos were like everybody likes this they'll take it they're you know they're good let's keep doing this 
you kind of had to because by the time you had finished the seventh movie, you had been blue balled and you were also seven movies in. You were so invested. You were seven movies in. Yes, we were so invested. We were so invested. We were willing to just take the bullshit. Awful. Apart from that, the acting was superb. True. The imagery was great. I felt all of the emotions. I, I appreciated the movie for what it was if you are considering the two of them together. Mm, it was not mm-hmm. my least favorite. It wasn't certainly my favorite, but I felt it did well. Um, and you have ever, you have the whole emotional scope of everything that they went through. It really did portray the book well. Mm-hmm. I guess for me, I will forgive the splitting of the movies for The Matrix because it was the first one to do that. It was experimental. It was a risk. But then, like, you could watch them and see why that was such a terrible artistic choice. And yet, because it was a good business choice, they make the same artistic choice in Harry Potter who gets no excuses. Okay, no excuses this time. Someone tried it. You saw the results and you did it again. But you Um, see, here's the deal. If they had done it, if they had done it at one movie we would have lost everything that happened in this movie. You're right. We would but have you know what? It would have been better for it. We wouldn't have watched the character. It then they wouldn't, wouldn't have run around in the woods. They wouldn't have run around in the woods. It would have been better for it. We would have had an, all we would have had was 30 minutes of running down in the woods and an hour and a half of an action sequence that sucked. Good. No, that's better. not good. That's better. I don't need, <laughs> no. I don't need extra of them running around in the woods. It's so boring. Oh, it wasn't. I loved it so much. It actually no. like enhanced the character and gave and gave actual context to what was happening. I actually felt like they were in a war. Okay, that's true. You do actually feel like they're in a war in this. Whereas, one. whereas with the with, with the this, I mean, okay, and well, I mean, like it's hard to split these two, but the second part two is literally it takes place in twenty four hours. It takes place in a day, and it's them fighting the entire time. There's no character development. There's no real relief that comes with it. It's also wretched because they spent so much time on the cool action fighting. It's it's like that it's like that one episode of the last season of Game of Thrones that it's like an hour and a half of just fighting. Oh my god. And they oh wouldn't have cut any of that. They wouldn't have cut any of that had it been a movie that was forced to be made once. And we would have lost like all the things that would have actually made this movie that like makes this movie okay would have been gone and it would have been terrible. But you know what they could have done that would have still fixed it and not made me really, really dislike this movie is if they would have not had such a huge break between releasing them. Release one. Yes. Release no, one for I summer. Agree. Release one for 100%. Christmas. Yes. Part one comes out. 100%. Part one, Six months. Yeah. It's fine. If part, you want to do part this, one you comes make out money. In, exactly. Part one comes out in June. It's your summer blockbuster. Part two comes out in December. It's your Christmas movie. I'm perfectly content. With solved. That. I think that that's great. I think that that's fantastic. It would have solved everything. Yes, it would have. We had to wait a year sucked. Yes, so that would have solved it. <laughs> so for me, um, like I, it's not just the movie being a whole movie of setup. It is also the release schedule and the fact that they should have known better because Matrix already showed them. To me, dreadful. Can't relate. Don't like this movie. And I'm at four. I I like the movie. I think it's good. I think that the capitalism choices that were made suck. But I also think that if we're taking the movie as the movie and the story, that's part of it. Makes sense. Just disagree. <laughs> the capitalism ruined this movie. It, it's a, a bad movie already. It made it worse. Yeah. All right. Final movie. And then final we have part movie. two. Yeah. Final movie is basically the battle of, for Hog- of Hogwarts. Okay. It, it takes place in 20... Like, that's something that, like, hit... I think I just read a Tumblr post about that recently. It, the entire movie takes place in 24 hours. Mm-hmm. They wake up on the day that they break into Gaunt, Green Gods and Voldemort is dead before sunrise the next day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm just like, wow, this, I hate this. <laughs> um, I hate the gre- the biggest sin, not the biggest sin because we still have fantastic beasts to talk about. But in this seven of the Harry Potter series, uh, the biggest sin that they committed was how they killed Voldemort. 
Yes, okay, so let me rant about that because I've just been kind of waiting for my turn so I can say how fucking stupid that was. Like, I get it, it's a visual medium. They want him dying to be visually interesting. But one of the actual good writing choices J.K. Rowling made is to make his death not visually interesting, okay? okay? So, like, there is absolutely no reason the movie had to do that. And I get that like, you know, there's people watching it that haven't read the books and they're going to be like, why did he just flop over? Like, okay, this is, this is easy to solve. You guys, this is easy to solve. If you really think people are going to be confused by a man dying by just flopping over, then you could have like literally a character say, you know, died as he died as a man, not the immortal God Harry, that he wished he was. How in his, Harry has an amazing, beautiful speech in the seventh book, which we are going to talk about when we talk about the seventh book. He has this beautiful, amazing speech that talks about that, that talks about at the end of the day, Keep the how speech. Riddle was just a man and he will just be a man for all of the rest of history. And then he kills him. And they could have done that. <laughs> yep, they could have just taken those words and adapted them in a way that Ugh. would make sense for them to be spoken in the movie and problem solved like if they but really thought said, people were going to be confused it's just it's such a dumb choice because you know there we've had a lot of like praise and criticisms of jk rowling's writing um we tend to really enjoy the action scenes you know we've we've praised those quite a lot this is another scene that when we get to the seventh book and we'll talk about it where like i really think the writing is actually very good like the amazing. prose is good and the movie is just like not right with it it's just they they, they totally change the point of it harry doesn't speak like actually physically in his body to anyone in the last hour of the movie, except for the last five minutes when the movie's wrapping up. He doesn't say a single word. It's all, I mean, some of it exists when he's talking to Dumbledore, but there's no main speech to Voldemort. There's no anything other than we're gonna die together, which is stupid. And so, I hate it so much and it loses so much meaning. <sighs> this movie sucks. This movie makes me angry. <laughs> It's not that good. It's not good. It's terrible. Yeah. Yep. I have no good things about this movie. The, like, just... even, oh, the choice to snap the wand. Dumb. Even bef he, before he fixes his own. That yeah. is something that makes me angry every time. In, in, the, in the books, we'll talk about it. Harry makes the choice to hide the elder wand uh, so that no one can ever have it again. But he needs to fix his wand first, which is, of course, a metaphor for how he fixed the wizarding world, blah, 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 blah. Um, but in the movie, he just straight up breaks the Elder Wand, which, by the way, this is a magical thing made by death itself. Gonna just snap it on a bridge. Okay. And then he doesn't even fix his own wand. Dumb. It's just dumb. So dumb. So dumb. Jed, Jed says so, and then nothing else. I feel like he's typing us like a massive paragraph right now. Jed, do you have something? Am I anticipating something right now? <laughs> I feel like I might be. Um, okay. You know what Twitch should do? Twitch should do what Discord does, and it'd be like, you know, so-and-so is typing, and we can have like the several people is typing meme on Twitch. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> I get why he broke his wand, but I didn't like it. Why not use it before helping fix Hogwarts? Um, or his want or anything. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. I get I get that, like, Harry doesn't you want... Okay, so if the point is supposed to be... Because here's, like, a point I could imagine where it would make sense. Harry doesn't want to use this power. The power should not be in the hands of one person. We saw when such great power was in the hands of one person, a.k.a. Voldemort, like, how that twisted them and, and fucked them up or whatever. But that doesn't match with the rest of Harry Potter because Harry literally becomes, like, the head of the, the Aurors. He's, like, the copiest yeah. cop that ever copped. And so we can't have him thinking things like that because that doesn't match with how what he actually becomes, right? So it just literally makes no sense. It makes no sense to the character. It makes no sense to the the morals of the movie um, because the the moral that it could make sense for just is just not how Harry Potter is just not present in the books or in the movies. So you know I could see a different character making that choice being like, no, we're not going to use this anymore, period, snap, you know, um, but they would have to be somebody that wouldn't become a cop as an adult. So, you know, that's not going to work. 
And again, this is not the choice that he made in the book. So this no. is a purely movie decision of being like, okay, what's a way that we can end this to feel it, to make it feel like we've tied all the ties and finished all the things. Oh, we'll just have him snap the wand. Like that, that is what it felt like. There was yeah. no higher message there. Yeah. Whereas like, at least with JKR, there was a thought behind it that not only made sense to the character, but actually like made sense to the the whole point that she was trying to produce, whether yes. we like that point or not. Yeah, I mean, we can argue about whether like she's morally right in, in some of the decisions that she makes, but hey, at least that decision matches her character and the book's morals. <laughs> so Yes! You Whereas know? the movie was just like, we need a visual representation because we've already made the man disappear into dust, so we need something a little bit more physical. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's fucking dreadful. Okay, I'm just gonna dislike. put it in dreadful. <laughs> dislike. Okay, so <laughs> as you can see, basically the Harry Potter movies are great until you get to the end, and part of it yeah. is an adaptation problem. When you're trying to adapt seven books, the choices that you make in the earlier adaptations are gonna affect the others, and in this case, it eventually screwed the series over, in our opinion, right? You can see that. And and also so, recognizing that when they started the movies, the books were not finished. Yes. So it's not only adaptation of like choices, it's, it's that they jumped the gun and started making those movies before they knew what was important. Yes. And now we've had this example of this happening in Harry Potter. We all know how we collectively pretend we weren't obsessed with Game of Thrones for a decade, even though like literally the whole world was obsessed with Game of Thrones for like a fucking decade. Yeah, but they, they ruined it with the last season, you know, and so a lot of people like, you know, don't even talk about as they were being fans, you know, so like this has happened. Thoughts, I don't think you're dead. Yeah. So this has happened now twice for major franchises where they started adapting them before they were finished being written. And it caused a lot of problems for the, the ending installments of that franchise. So this is a lesson to adapt adapters. I get that you want to like strike while the iron's hot. The property's popular. Let's do our adaptation. We'll make a boat, boatload of money. You're right. But just know that most likely by the end, you're going to have garbage on your hands. It is very, very difficult to do an adaptation that of such a long piece of media and actually have the ending be good before you know what the ending is in the original work. Lesson to all of us. <laughs> That's what happened with Harry Potter. But you know what? I still love all of these movies in a way because next we're going to talk about the Fantastic Beasts trilogy. This is the moment you've been waiting for. I'll try to remember in YouTube to put a little chapter marker here for the Fantastic Beasts. But you guys that have been watching live, it's time. It's time. Transhumanist debate. Do it, Jed. Let's do it. We'll be we'll all be robots in the future anyway, right? We'll upload our consciousness. It'll be awesome. Okay, Fantastic Beast time. We're gonna start with the first Fantastic Beast. Um, okay. I just have a couple of things about this first movie. I will say, when I first saw it, it the movie's a little bit of a mess, but I was like, this is kind of charming. I love Newt Scamander. I think he's fantastic. I think the actor portraying him is excellent. And I like the little creatures. Anytime that Newt gets to interact with the creatures themselves, I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to see. Give me more of this. So I came out of the first movie like really like curious about what was what was going to happen. Where were they going to go with this part of the franchise? I was intrigued. Casting, loved it. Yes. Acting, loved it. Uh, visual effects was fantastic. I yeah, they're just like apparating around all over the place. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what they should be doing in Harry Potter. Like boom, 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 everywhere. I appreciated the access to new lore. I appreciated the access to, uh, I, I even appreciated like the subtle differences between like Harry Potter, like not Harry Potter, uh, American wizards and European wizards. I appreciated that there was so much detail carried to this. I think the thing is, is that you can tell by watching this first movie, movie that the person who pushed this, who wrote it, who wanted it to happen loved harry potter that's true i think like, that's loved true. It. 
Um, and I personally am under the belief that when this movie was made in concept, when this movie was starting to be produced, when this movie was had all the pre-production exist, and it was still trying to be greenlit by like Warner Brothers, I honestly believed that it was supposed to be a standalone movie. I agree. And Warner Brothers came back and said, we love this, make five of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so suddenly had to struggle with how to connect this to five more movies. Yeah. And they already had the script written. They already had everything done. So they were able to make a couple of edits and add a Grindelwald sub sub subplot there that might have already existed there because it was of that era and time, but didn't but didn't revolve around it. In my in my opinion, this was a perfect movie, like an entertaining access movie to the wizarding world and in a world that we already knew that existed that placated certain fans that uh held like held expectations but also was accessible to anybody who wasn't really that into harry potter uh this movie was awesome it was funny it was fun it was delightful Yep. Yep. Um, overall, I, I really like this movie. I just think that like the reveal at the end of like, oh, Grindelwald, and it's going to be about that is kind of like, it comes out of left field. It's a little bit like, what? Like there's multiple movies going on inside this movie. And I thoroughly enjoyed one of them. And the others I was kind of like, meh about. So that's kind of like how this movie makes me feel. It, I, it, parts of it are charming and parts of it make me feel confused, which like sure. I have a lot of complaints about some of the later installments of the other Harry Potter movies, like from the main series, but they never make me feel confused, right? They never make me feel confused. I know why they made the choices they made. I don't think they're great choices, um, but I never, I never feel like I'm confused. I think the only way you would feel confused watching the original movies is if, um, you are watching them as they were releasing and never reading the books. You know what I mean? Um, but these don't have books backing them up. It's just the movie. So it's a little yeah. bit of a different situation. So um, I, I actually enjoy this movie. There's a lot of points in it that I like. Um, and I think you're totally right, Landon. I think that for this movie, it was probably originally conceptualized as a standalone movie. And then they got told, like, let's make a series. And they were like, oh, okay, uh, what else is going on in this time period in the Harry Potter world? Oh, Grindelwald's going on in this time period. Let's have um, let's have a, a Grindelwald thing going on. But I really think it was conceptualized as just something in regards to like between Newt and young Dumbledore. I think those are probably the main um, things that they were trying to write about. And then the other stuff got added on after. And I, and I don't even think that they were trying to write about, like in the original concept of it, I think it, it had nothing. It was not connecting at all. It was like, what's a fun story that we could tell with vaguely familiar characters. We know we have this mini book of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Let's build a story out of that. Mm -hmm. Like the Dumbledore line is even a throwaway line That's in true. the first book. Like mm -hmm. it has the relationship between them isn't anything. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and i and i think it makes it very obvious that it's, it's all throw like it's all there the things that this mo that this movie make me angry about is specifically and i won't go into huge amount of detail because we are eventually probably going to talk about the movies uh but jkr's just deciding to rewrite the idea that any sort of racism would exist within 1920s America. So dumb. Uh, and then make the president of the of the wizarding United States a black woman. Well, it's <laughs> like the same. Completely be yeah. like, oh, they're super racist against no magics, that there's no such thing as like, you can't be in a relationship with a non-magical person. But even though racism exists everywhere else in the United States at this age, it doesn't exist within america so right i think you're so right um it doesn't make any sense it shows that she really doesn't understand anything about america um which mm -hmm. is not surprising because we already knew that from oh. her you know american wizarding magical school which um appropriated a bunch of stuff and she didn't even get it right in regards to like native american culture like it just makes I no sense i can't wait until we talk i feel like when we talk about this movie in depth i'm able to tell you i'm able to tell the people and dive into my theory yeah of how the school should have been even more 
Yep. <laughs> but the point is, for me, this movie is charming. It has a lot of charming qualities. It, to me, it's acceptable. It's, it's It was decent. It made me curious about what else they could make about Harry Potter. And I thought, like, this could be cool. Like, that was kind of my overall feeling at the time. I was like, this could be cool. I don't hate this. It's neat. So I'm going to throw this actually in Outstanding. So. Oh, you really love it. I loved it. I think it was fantastic. It was a fun reintroduction to the series. It was interesting. It was. I loved it as a one-off. I gladly watched it again. I thought Newt was great. I thought the only person that I didn't like was, uh, I don't even remember her name, Queenie's sister. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The love interest for Newt. I was like, meh, I don't like this character. But other than that, everything else was great. It was fantastic. Yeah. Um, before we move to the next movie, I just want to highlight some of these awesome comments from Jed in regards to um, Voldemort and transhumanism. Um, so he said, I, I mean, I think given I wrote a straight up dissertation about the balance of transhumanist and humanizing tendencies in Harry Potter universe. I do think that's a very interesting topic. Um, the Elder Wand is presented as something post-human, a step too far, so it wouldn't fit the narrative to not destroy it. Um, even if it was being used to achieve a huge amount of net good, the books and films both make a good case against keeping hold of it. To be honest, the old target on the back, if you're not Giga Juice's dirty history. Yes, I agree. I just think that for Harry's, uh, my comment on this is I totally agree. I just think that for Harry's character, it makes no sense to fix a few things. He Like he should fix a few things first. That's his character. Okay, that's what makes sense. Um, and then he can destroy it, right? I so think- and the way it does in the book just makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah, the way in the book that it happens makes sense. The way that it happens in the movie, the idea that we have been talking about magical objects and have been hunting magical objects for the last two movies, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden just snap a magical object that yeah. has been given to us by death in half, uh, and also has a bloody history, doesn't make any magical sense. Like, there's no vibe. sensible there. Yeah. Uh, that's my biggest issue with it. But the destroying of it, yes, it should. It, it absolutely has to be. Absolutely. It should be destroyed, just not the way that, not as quickly as it happens in the movie. Um, second point is the point you made about Voldemort's death is, death is interesting too. Voldemort is presented as inhuman due to his entire life goal being uh, to slack off death entirely, which is one of the most inherently biological trappings we have. Yes, good point. Um, it's a bit of a weird one if you think deeply about it. Despite having all these mad post-human traits, it all comes down to love tying the good wizards to humanity, whereas the Death Eaters are dehumanized to a pretty decent extent. The Malfoy arc brings that to light. Yes, you're absolutely right. I cannot wait to talk more about that. When we do our seventh book, um, we're going to we're gonna get into some of that. I'm really excited. <laughs> uh, but I love all those points, Jed, very much. Okay. Um, the next movie that comes up is uh, Crime Where did you of- put yours? Sorry. Oh, I put mine in acceptable. It's a high acceptable to me. Um, okay. Because overall, it just made me feel like it just overall made me feel like this is cute and charming. And I'm curious about where they could go with this and, and where they could make it. And honestly, if they had made two more movies that were basically the same thing of like really just focused on Newt interacting with creatures, I would have loved them. I would have been thoroughly entertained, you know, but that's not what they did. That's no. not what no. they did at all. <laughs> So next we have Crimes of Grindelwald. Um, And this movie is heavily connected. I will say, um, just because I I just feel like if we don't say it, we're kind of like, you know, not presenting it properly. This movie is heavily connected with the real life situation between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. And I am not an, an expert on domestic abuse. So I'm not here to say like whether Team Johnny or Team Amber is correct. Um... But, uh, but yeah, so Johnny Depp is Grindelwald in this movie and he's replaced in the next movie by Mads Mikkelsen due to everything going on with that. So just for anybody that wants us to talk about that, I'm just here to tell you that like, I'm I'm not gonna talk about it. So I hope that answers your question. But I do recognize it. It's an important part of how this movie was received. <laughs> yes. Yes. So thoughts on Crimes of Grindelwald? It was boring. Yes. Like that's that's the thing like with this movie is that I don't have I I am I am nonplussed one way or the other because I was so bored the entire time. Concept was cool. I I did enjoy like here's the reality. I did enjoy diving into the Grindelwald arc. Yeah. Because I think that that's a cool story in Wizarding World history that would be interested interesting to tell. I think it is a fucking stretch trying to connect it to 
uh, Newt, Newt Scamander, Scamander yeah. <laughs> and magical creatures and fantastic beasts. And I think that that's where the biggest issue is, is this like two things that have nothing to do with each other, constantly having to be forced to interact. Yes. Um, yes. I think Jude Law played Dumbledore very well. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like Jude Law's actually, Dumbledore too. I actually appreciate his Dumbledore in this movie. We'll talk about the next one in a second. Uh, but in this one, because he does give that sly, manipulative sort of aspect of being like, oh, you understand who Dumbledore is, especially mm-hmm. in his youth when he was a more ambitious man. Um, I also, I appreciate some concepts that exist, but honestly, I couldn't tell you other than one scene that makes me extremely angry. I couldn't tell you anything that happened in this movie. <laughs> And I, I guess that's it. kind of how I feel too, because when I think about this movie, um, I really do enjoy Jude Law's performance as Dumbledore, but I really don't have a lot of other comments on it. Um, and I will say also a little bit about Jude Law's um, Dumbledore is Jude Law has this fantastic ability that no matter what he's doing and no matter what he's in, he looks a little bit inhuman, which is why he's fantastic in AI. Yes. If you've never seen that movie, he plays a, uh, an android robot character. Um, he's fantastic. Uh, very good. And in Crimes of Grindelwald, he gives Dumbledore this sort of like inhuman glow about him that really matches the way that Harry imagines Dumbledore in the books. And I so vibed with that. I was like, oh, this is the Dumbledore of Harry's imagination. Um, And I just, I think it was like really cool. I also think it does a really good job matching Grindelwald within it too. Because we've seen Grindelwald as very like, inhuman and very uh more powerful and sly than anything else especially with like how he's treated in this movie where he could he basically anytime that he talks he can convince someone he has, he's a golden tongue basically uh and it's it's interesting to be able to see that both sides of this coin is inhuman in that subtle way mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yep but um I really have to say in regards to this movie, I agree. The way it makes me feel overall is just bored. It feels like a filler movie. So I remember when I first watched this, um, I, we, we all watched it together because my in my household, we had, we had pretty well enjoyed the first um, Fantastic Beast movie. We were like, well, let's watch the second one. And we watched it. And um, I think think we really struggled to not fall asleep was how I remember it going down and afterwards we were just like wow Harry Potter's bad now (laughs) what happened it's bad now um and that was like our (laughs) overall like feeling like because I for you guys that don't know um me and my husband one of our early early dates was going and seeing the first or sorry the fourth um movie together and so we had watched pretty much all the Harry Potter movies together and and we we enjoyed them like he knows that I love Harry Potter and um and it's a big part of like my fandom life but he also enjoys Harry Potter too he thinks they're pretty good um you know he's interested in them and so we would see them together a lot and it was kind of like we just looked at each other and we were like huh watching Harry Potter together isn't can't, isn't our thing anymore they're not good any it's not good anymore you know it was like that feeling um and uh and yeah so this movie overall it's just like it's boring it feels like filler it feels like setup even though it's not like it's not like a whole movie of setup the way that the first part of the seventh book movie is but it it feels like that it feels like that um it definitely feels like that and then um and then we gotta talk about the queer baiting in the room my god uh at this point, J.K. Rowling had been very forthcoming about the fact that uh, Dumbledore was queer and gay. Uh, that came out after the seventh Harry Potter book was published uh, in 2008. And uh, so it was not a secret. And she nope. had written an entire Pottermore history on him that he and Grindelwald were, in fact, lovers, had been in love. Um, and that they that they had that relationship and that's what really drove him to changing his ways and that was the only man Dumbledore had ever loved. Uh, so it set up a lot of expectations and stuff like that. Um, and it wasn't that gay. And, it wasn't that gay. And and the the scene that makes it the gayest is that Dumbledore says we're closer than brothers. 
Uh, it was set up to be a very LGBTQ mo movie. Like there was hints of it. There was in the trailer. It was so queer baby. Um, and, and in a time where, again, this was four, four years ago. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like this happened in the early 2000s. We're this not was, talking. This was not like, long ago. This is four years ago. Queer marriage, gay marriage has been accepted for majority of Americans by that point for years. <laughs> uh, and the best Hollywood and JKR herself could do was say that we're closer to brothers. brothers. Wait, brothers, I mean, that's the code, right? That's the code when you wish you could have written, written a character nice. queer and then, and, but you can't because the studio doesn't let you. Like they literally used the code in, a, in, a, in an era where everyone wanted to see the real gay. Everyone yeah. wanted to see it, everyone. Uh, and they were like, closest and, brothers. And the, it was not, it was not Warner Brothers who didn't do that. No! I mean, po it po possibly, but it was JKR. She didn't I mean, want everybody, to, even though she had confirmed it every other way, she didn't want on a big screen to show. She didn't fight for it. Thing. She did not like if it was Warner Brothers decision, she just rolled over and took it. Like, we don't know, obviously, yeah. how those conversations went, but we do know JKR didn't fight for it. She didn't care. Yep. Dreadful. And she was a direct writer on the script. Yes. Or Dreadful. Theory, I should say. So they, they so released like, this movie and truly nobody liked it. Like, literally, it was like the fine. meme. Everyone disliked that. That dreadful. I, dreadful See, like i i'm not even gonna read it as dreadful because i want the impact of what this next movie is going to be so for me it went from amazing to meh which is poor for me like the lower end of poor whatever i i could watch it again and still not tell you what happened about it yeah like that drop big drop yep okay yeah. next movie um, I actually just watched this recently, and I watched it for this stream. So I got some, fr I got fresh, I got it fresh in my memory, you guys. Um, this movie, but the majority of this movie, I felt deeply confused. I had no idea what was happening, and they early in the movie they have this scene where they're like, "We have to make it confusing because Grindelwald has these like powers where he can predict what's going to happen, and so you know we can can't we... we can't make it." But it's like, okay, but it's so stupid. It's so stupid because like I shouldn't be confused. Grindelwald can be confused. I shouldn't be confused. Okay, like Knives Out. Knives Out, very confusing movie. But I am not confused. All the characters are confused. I am not confused. But they like throw this scene in. It's like their little excuse about you're gonna be confused confused because we're doing it on purpose but like Grindelwald should be confused not me not me but I was confused so that's how this movie made me feel confused and stupid we need I feel like context needs to be added here okay because in in the fallout of Johnny being recast as Mads Michelson Mm -hmm. The studio also dropped the contract from five movies to an unknown number of movies. Yes. Uh, so all of a sudden, a guaranteed five movie contract of having five movies that they had been planning on how to tell the story that they were planning could be ending by this next movie with this recast. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on how bad the press was with Johnny, depending on how the movie did with the new actor, X, Y, and Z, uh, and also the coming, like the movie, they still made money with uh, the crimes of Grindelwald, but they certainly didn't make what they were making prior mm -hmm. to Harry Potter movies. So uh, the writers all of a sudden had to not, to make a movie that could be ended in a place where there was never going to be another movie again and that was going to satisfy fans where there might be one more movie after this and that could satisfy fans or there could be two more movies and that satisfy fans so the writers didn't have any help here uh and because of that they made this mess of a motherfucking movie it's awful. that makes that has no continuity with the prior two movies mm -hmm. uh, because a part and I like don't want to dig into much but like the whole magic system of how magic is run and the minister of magic makes no sense nope uh, the the entire magical world at this point doesn't make any sense um, and 
what is actually happening in the movies. Like I didn't even know, I couldn't understand what the name of this small creature they were hunting for so long. There was no co- I didn't, I had to watch the movie twice before I understood what that was. I was like, what is happening here? Um, it's, it's terrible. Really bad. Terrible. Really, really bad. So, uh, and, I mean, this movie doesn't do anybody any favors in any way whatsoever. Um, it's not even, like, bad compared to the Harry Potter. Because, like, how I've been ranking these is kind of, like, within the Harry Potter movie realm, right? Like, if I was ranking these against other movies, obviously these would not be dreadful movies. Like, they're not that bad. They're just bad compared to their other Harry Potter movies, right? But this, this is a bad movie, period, full stop compared to all other movies it is bad and there are like okay there are a few positive points i will give them to you now this movie's gayer than crimes of grindelwald that was that was that was (laughs) nice yeah it's like you know on a on a scale of one to ten crimes of grindelwald was like number number one gay and um secrets of dumbledore was like number four gay um so you know it was a little gayer that was fun that was fun we, um, we at least got we at least got Jude Law saying I I was in love with you. Yeah, I mean at least they acknowledged that they was they were exes. So like that was nice. Wish I would have had that in the previous movie, but we got it here. Whatever. Um, other no, the I, other the bar at that point is so low that I'm just like I can't I can't. But I was just surprised. I was just surprised. I was like because people complained about this movie. No one told back. me it was yeah. No one told me it was a little bit gayer. So I was like pleasantly surprised at that scene. I was like oh. Sure. Yeah, they're exes okay um okay and the other thing that i enjoyed there's only three things other thing i enjoyed about this movie is the scene where newt has to go save his friend and they they like sideways do this crab lobster walk that was so funny that was so <laughs> cute i loved that scene okay it was so good uh brother by the way <laughs> oh yeah his like, brother that's the, other yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. that's the other thing too it's like you're like how are any of these people related who are yeah they? i was so confused i couldn't i i didn't even remember that that was his brother but you're right so he goes and saves his brother um and they do this like little crab walk out and then his brother steps on a, on one of them and he, it squishes into this really satisfying like crunchy nasty sound and then all of the um lobster things like get scared and run away and then the big lobster attacks them anyway that whole scene start to finish i'm sorry i spoiled the whole scene for you it's the best part of the movie amazing so good um anytime and it's just because it's just newt sillily inter- interacting with creatures and you know the actor does just such a good job he's fantastic at doing that um i loved it okay third thing that was good about the movie the chillin them things is cute as fuck i want a plushie okay and you know how bad this movie you know how bad this movie is there is one chillin plushie on the entire internet it is handmade over a hundred dollars from etsy that is it that is it there is one on the entire internet and some artist in ukraine has to hand make it for you i am not joking the chillins are cute as fuck. The cutest magical creature Harry Potter universe has ever come up with. And I cannot buy a plushie for less than $150. That is a travesty. Okay. That is a cr- human rights violation. That is a crime. Okay. No, it's not. Oh my God. <laughs> I am devastated that I cannot own a chillin for the background of my streams. I am not going to spend $150 on a plushie, okay? Like, they're, it's handmade. $150 is a very fair price for the level of detail in that plushie. I ain't going to spend it. I'm not going to spend $150 on any plushie, okay? No matter how good it is. But yeah, that is a crime, and I'm very upset by this. That's the three, good, that's the was... three, three things I enjoyed in this movie. Okay. I, I hated everything else. It was confusing and frustrating. Good. I have nothing good to say about that. <laughs> And it's it'll frustrating. Be really it'll be really fun ripping it apart when we do a stream on it. Okay, so do a stream on it. I have to ask the the chat and y'all in the YouTube comments. Please tell me um, if you have enjoyed this section of the stream. Please let us know down below yes. so that we know when to prioritize actually doing a stream where we dissect these three movies. Because now yeah, that we cause... know we're, that we're not going to get anymore, at some point we will do that stream. So y'all let but us that's know. That's the other thing we don't know. They're still the. They, they ain't doing no more. Out. Everyone hated the Dumbledore movie. They it's like might, the dumb might. Bulldore movie. Uh, I think that this movie was terrible, and then what really solidified it was the Dumbledore is the best person ever propaganda. That's Ugh. all I'm gonna say. Barf. Uh, and I'm I'm gonna put it in troll. Oh yeah, it's totally troll. Barf. Yeah. Um. 
they totally do that. They try to pretend that like Dumbledore is the purest of pure hearts and like why they like literally just, take it's it's, it's wrong. It. it was a hundred it was this moment that i was like ah and this is when joanne walked into the studio and this was the moment she said no you need to make dumbledore the good guy here Bark. and this was the moment that she got so tired of everyone saying that dumbledore was manipulative and not pure of heart that she's like i literally am gonna make it canon that he is I hate it. I hate it so much. It takes it takes all of the fun out of the fandom version of Dumbledore, who is complicated, and and it, it actually all the interesting. It takes all of the interesting readings yeah. away from Dumbledore's character that makes him a character that's worthy of dissection. Yes. Boring. So anyway, so boring. here's our tier lists. Well, you can see them down below. There's my tier list down there. What do you guys think? Um, I would love to see yours. So I'm gonna I'm gonna save mine in my account. Um, and you guys should make an account too. Yeah, title of tier list. Okay, we're gonna give it Karen's I'll make an account HP later. movie rankings. Save. You guys should do it. Tell me what you think. Um, what your your tiers are. And um, and yeah, I would love to see them. Thank you, Lunar. Thank you so much, <gasps> Lunar. I enjoyed doing this. Okay, you guys, let's actually switch back to the other view. Here we go. Okay. So I'm glad you liked this Lunar because guess what we're doing next week? We're doing another rankings. Um, yeah, we're going to be ranking. doing, um, oh, nope. Landon, oh, you got to share your sorry. screen. Your camera's gone. There you go. Okay. Now they can see you again. <laughs> okay. Um, but they can't say, see sorry. your screen anymore. Don't worry. Um, right. Okay. So I'm glad you really liked this lunar because we're doing this next week too. We're going to do a different ranking. The ranking that we have for next week is about which of the Harry Potter male characters would hold your drink for you while you went to the bathroom at the bar. Ah, oh, thank you for the applause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to, we're going to rank some Harry Potter dudes. It's going to be real fun. Um, we're going to get to do a little, some little like little mini character dissections because I put 26 characters on there because I ain't got no chill. <laughs> so it's going to be like rapid fire. I'm like so five, everybody gets like five minutes, like five minutes tops of comments on that character um, while we rank them. Let's see if we can do it in two hours. What do you guys think? I'm not honestly not sure we can. We're going to find there, out. There are a couple that we're just going to be like, no. Like Bella Trix's will not hold my drink. So sorry. Well, it's all it's dudes. Bella's not no, on there because it's no, dudes. No, I know, but, but I yeah, yeah, yeah. Her as an example, because she's not going to be on there. But True. there are similar characters, similar to Bella Trix Lestrange, where we're going to be like, no, <laughs> he, he will drug it. I know he will. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Fair. All right. So, um, Landon, where can everybody find you? you can find me at land in maine it's a pun on twitter and instagram you can also I don't know, let's promote my book i wrote a book several years ago you can buy that on amazon it's called around the world and back again a collection of poetry from here there and everywhere yes that's true you did it's a poetry book it's really cool um so land in socials there we go. There's all of her things. You guys should definitely follow her Instagram and Twitter as well. I The adventures this weekend is I got a brand new desk. I'm not currently sitting at it. Uh, it is spread all over my floor of my office right now. So it'll be me putting that together this adventure uh, this weekend. And next week, you guys will get to see the new view. Yes. Hopefully. Okay. Um, here's where you can find me. You can find me right here on Twitch. We stream on Saturdays and we stream on Thursdays. So um, we have a lot of fun on Saturdays. That's like with multiple people. Usually Landon is here with me. We do community days, all kinds of fun stuff. All of my VODs are on YouTube. Twitter is my main social media. So if you want to always get up to date on where I am with various things, Twitter is always going to have the latest updates. If you really, really love me and just want to hang out with me more, you can also join my Discord. The other good reason to join my Discord, even if you don't want to hang out with me, is you get really reliable pings there. So I make sure you guys get pinged whenever we go live and whenever I post a video to YouTube, because as we know, Twitches and YouTubes, um, pings are not that reliable. So if you always want to know, join the discord, get the, get the ping rolls. And, um, and that's, that's that about that. Okay, you guys. So, um, all of that being said, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my cousin is streaming. I had no idea she was going to go live, but she's streaming Stray. That's fun. 
Yeah, she's streaming Stray right now. And so we're going to go raid her because I tried to play Stray on Thursday. It made me super motion sick. I'm going to experiment this evening, actually. So for you guys that were curious about if it's possible to fix what made me so motion sick in Stray, I'm going to try to find out. And I'll make a pinned comment on that VOD with um, if I was able to find a solution or not, or if I had to like return um, the game because I got too motion sick. But we're going to raid her. So upper stories, we're going to raid her. You should definitely give her a follow when we get there. Yeah, I'll let you guys know. Yes, cat content. Cat content. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. This was really fun. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, guys. See you later. Bye.